Hi, I'm Mark Terrell of Uncommon Knowledge and welcome to five tips for treating inferiority complex, self-esteem lifting strategies to help clients who feel they're worse than others. Now, Anthony Trollope, the Victorian English novelist said, never think that you're not good enough. People will take you very much at your own reckoning. So that was a sort of humorous take on a problem which, if you suffer from a serious inferiority complex, is of course deadly serious. So Tammy, 19, felt inferior. That's what her mum told me when booking her appointment. As I got up to answer the, uh, the call of the doorbell, I mused that feeling inferior can only be done through comparison. You know, we can only feel inferior in relation to something or someone else. So as I opened the door, I further sort of reflected for, uh, for feelings of inferiority to be, a, to be a complex, as Tammy's mother described it, we need to feel emotional about feeling inferior. Okay, so I know I'm an inferior mathematician to say uh, Manjul Begava, but I have no particular feelings about that. Okay, it's good for him, I say, you know, feeling inferior then is different from objectively knowing that we might be inferior to someone in a particular way. Okay, so it's an emotional aspect. Time to stop my musings and focus outwards. So I smiled at Tammy and welcomed her and she was diffident but friendly. And I wanted to know what the problem was from her perspective. So what does never feeling good enough mean to you? And she said, well, I feel anxious a lot of the time. Was a, that a subtle crack in her voice, a bottled up sob? Okay, so what do you feel anxious about, I asked her. The deep sadness I saw sitting dolefully within such young eyes left me feeling a little emotional myself. Okay, and she said, I, I feel as if I can never be good enough. You know, when I see others, I know you're not supposed to compare yourselves, but I just think I'm ugly and stupid in comparison. So feeling inferior is intrinsic to low self-esteem. But here I want to focus more specifically on what's being called comparanoia, constantly comparing yourself to others and finding yourself lacking. So how do people get to the point of feeling less than others or less than they should be? Okay, let's look at the anatomy of the inferiority complex. Confidently knowing that Usain Bolt can run faster than you is not the same as feeling inferior unless you really, really care about that. Okay, a real inferiority complex has us feeling that we should be as good as others, but we're not. Uh, we're not as good as others, but we don't really know why that is. Okay, so it's a generalized feeling of inadequacy, not based on rational judgments or evidence necessarily. So Tammy found it hard to articulate why she felt inferior. It wasn't a cognitive thing. It was an emotional sense that she carried with her, privately and painfully. The emotions of feeling inferior comprise of anxiety, a fear of somehow being found out or unmasked as completely inadequate, um, a sense of imposter syndrome, even when you're achieving good things in your life or, or your social life. Hopelessness and helplessness, two key ingredients of depression. Feeling that whatever you do, it just can't be good enough or it can't be as good as you're supposed to be at it or as other people seem to be. No matter how well you do, it still won't be good enough. Okay, even high achievers can feel like failures and imposters. Anger is another thing and defensiveness, resentment and envy and possibly guilt about those feelings. Okay, can also be included into the mix. Tammy said that she often felt ugly. Now, objectively, she certainly wasn't, but that's the nature of the beast. Feeling ugly can be totally disconnected from the objective perception others have of you. And of course, any evidence to the contrary can easily be rejected or rationalized away. Indeed, it must be if the inferiority complex is to survive. But Tammy repeatedly told me she felt not good enough. She found it hard to be specific at first, but then it's always hard trying to articulate feelings when they have no real basis in thought. So where might an inferiority complex originate? In a world that encourages us to buy stuff because we're worth it, while simultaneously force feeding us airbrushed perfection, it's easy for an inferiority complex to uh, take hold. 
We're told it's what's on the inside that counts, but we're saturated on the outside by people seemingly exciting, rewarding, beautiful lives. We're drowning in the fantasy while being told it doesn't matter. And in a way, if we believed in lifelong self-improvement, none of us are good enough. We haven't measured up to everything we could be, at least not yet. But self-objectively knowing us, our own shortcomings and seeking to improve them is not the same as feeling emotional about ourselves, or as Tammy sometimes did, self-despising. She had self-harmed in the past and had also been through periods of bulimia. Maybe a client has been told they weren't good enough by a parent, okay, or a primary caregiver or someone else when they were very young. One woman, one woman I know was repeatedly told by her mother that she was the ugliest girl in the street and no one liked her. Or maybe they've been constantly compared to other people. Why can't you be more like your sister? Okay, so other people might feel inferior because they're perfectionists. They feel that anything less than perfection is completely inadequate. Being at war with the self is painful. We always need to be on our own side, to be our own support and encouragement. But there's something else. How good looking are you? How tall? How rich? How smart? How popular? How deeply loved and adored? We can only be tall or short or rich or poor, attractive or ugly in comparison to others. In a world with a population of one, good looking would have no meaning at all. 150 years ago, you would have uh, known your neighbors and a few other locals perhaps who would probably have been similar to you in many ways. You may have been vaguely aware of a few famous people, but that was it. In today's world, it's a very different place. Now we can glide silently through the lives and status updates, status being the operative word, of much of the world, not least of all the rich and airbrushed. Tammy was spending four to five hours a day on social media. She admitted it often made her feel sad, ugly, and generally inferior, but she felt pressured to be on there. Now, researchers at Glasgow University have found that nighttime usage of social media is associated with poor sleep, lower self-esteem, and increased anxiety and depression. And it's no wonder constant monitoring of how many or how few likes or positive responses uh, they're getting on social media can train young people to become dependent on the approval of others and depressed when it isn't forthcoming. Such dependence on outside approval is a recipe for unhappiness and poor emotional adjustment. And of course, there are many advantages to social media, but like any tool, it can be misused or even, in the case of cyberbullying, weaponized. But we're not defenseless. If we can only relax our expectations as to how we should be and understand that the way uh, others present themselves to the world is heavily edited, then we can relax about how others seem to be and how we seem to them. And I'm not just talking about online. So this was my challenge with Tammy. So what can we do for a client with an inferiority complex? Tip one for treating inferiority complex. Deal with emotional memories. Having an inferiority complex means having an array of unhappy feelings, some of which will fuel the thoughts. Helping people examine their own thoughts, widen their perspectives and challenge emotional thinking, which is always restricted, can be valuable and effective. But when the feelings are really strong, it can be easier to deal with them directly. When we do this, our thoughts tend to naturally become fairer and more moderate. I asked Tammy to hone in on the feelings of never being good enough. What did that feel like? And with closed eyes, she focused on the feeling. and It wasn't hard for her to access it because she was very good at accessing that feeling. Next, I asked her if the feelings produced any particular memory in which she'd had similar feelings. <clears throat> this is known as the affect bridge technique. And she thought for a moment and said, no, but eventually a painful memory of being teased and tormented at school when she was eight came to mind. Now I asked her to open her eyes and focus on a time she felt good. And once she had accessed these resourceful feelings, I had her go back to that day at school 
watch it calmly from the outside and as her adult self comfort her eight-year-old self and sort that time out. And she reported feeling very calm with that memory um, after we used this helping hand technique. And we did this with all kinds of painful memories and with uh, time, the pattern began to change. Okay, so you can watch me do this technique with my low self-esteem client, Emily, inside Uncommon Practitioners TV. In her case, the old memories was of having books thrown at her at school uh, when she tried to speak in class. Next, we can remind our clients that only they can be them. When this idea hits home as a feeling, not just a yeah, yeah, I know thought, the impact can be profound. Tip two, drop the mime. Here lies Rachel. She was quite like Susan, read no gravestone ever. All Rachel can be is Rachel or the best possible version of herself. She's not ever going to be Susan and she shouldn't be. In the words of Oscar Wilde, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. Wanting to look like, sound like, live like and be like someone else is to abandon what makes us unique. How can an impersonator ever be true to themselves? Plastic replica lives don't make people happy. That's not to say we can't learn from others, but being inspired by someone means assimilating some of their traits into who you are. It doesn't mean trying to have their exact same life. Inferiority complexes thrive on people wanting to be someone they're not. And this doesn't mean uh, we have to limit ourselves as to what we can do or, or accomplish in life, but it does mean that we can get by much better when we don't try to be someone else. Inferiority complexes thrive on people wanting to be someone they're not. I talked about plastic lives to Tammy, and I also used other metaphors, analogies, and hypnotic storytelling to help her broaden her sense of herself as herself, not some inadequate copy of anyone else. We can also help our clients in another way. Tip three, get specific. Tammy wasn't too specific about why she felt inferior, other than feeling ugly, even though she knew she wasn't, okay? But it can sometimes be useful to get specific with clients. What exactly have they been feeling inferior about? Emotional thinking is always sloppy and all or nothing. So we can help our clients tighten it up to make it less emotional. There are around 7 billion people on this planet, last time I counted. Which one does your client feel inferior to? Rich people, good looking people, academic people, accomplished people, whatever that means. Most people aren't these things, at least not in any extreme way. Is your client being too busy, uh, being selective as to whom they compare themselves with? If I just compare myself to Nobel Prize winners, I'll certainly see a bit of a gulf between their achievements and my achievements. On the other hand, if I compare myself to people uh, I feel have achieved less than me, maybe I could be a bit less harsh on myself. Okay, so who do we compare ourselves to? Well, here's a thought. Maybe I could just drop it all together. Okay, which leads me to the next intervention, tip four. Dare to be different. Life is much less restrictive than it used to be in westernized countries. In the 50s, you were expected to be married in your early 20s, uh, to have kids and to have a respectable career. So grave, grave robbers need not apply. To have short hair or long hair, depending on gender, to dress properly, to have all the right opinions. Okay. Now we haven't cast aside all these norms and I'm not even suggesting that they're all bad even, but people are much freer now to live a bit differently. Okay. No one is a failure if they're unmarried at 40 or 80 for that matter, or if they don't have kids or a traditionally professional career. Not in terms of current societal norms, though your parents may still have some um, expectations which uh, link back to those times. The kind of thinking that prompts, oh no, I'm 45 now, I should have a mortgage, a partner, 2.4 children, I should be how other people are, is a trap. You know, are those things right for you? If you really want these things, that's one thing. But if you only want them because you feel they're expected of you, then remember this, your life can only be lived by you. So we can encourage our clients 
to explore what they want to do as distinct from what they feel they are or were supposed to do, okay, the expectations of others. What do you think? What do you want? And these are the questions I kept asking Tammy. I wanted to get to the bottom of what she wanted, not what she thought she should want or what other people expected. And she said she felt validated by this, but really, really all I was doing was addressing her, uh, the one and only Tammy, addressing the unique her. It's also useful to look at just what a client might be expecting. So tip five, oust the utopian assumptions. People who feel inferior tend to think in all or nothing ways. Actually, any emotion will drive us to do this. Utopianism is one form of the simplified if-only thinking. If only I was 20 pounds lighter, then I'd be confident and happy. If only I earned 10,000 more a year, then my life would be good. If only I could be exactly like Bob, then I'd feel great about my himself. So life doesn't work like that. Sure, you might have more confidence if you lose 20 pounds, at least for a while, but because much of what we feel inferior about is relatively uh, superficial, band-aid remedies will always leave the uh, non-superficial part of us wanting more. So even if I earn a million a year, it won't be long before I start thinking, if only I earned two million. So why? Because I still haven't satisfied what I actually need as a human being. So we all have deeper needs, and until those needs are met, there may be an aching disconnect between what we feel we want and what we really need. Whole lifetimes might be predicated on this mismatch and the bewilderment and lack of fulfillment it causes. So how could Tammy start being herself more? Chronic comparanoia tends to drop away quite naturally when we begin to live in more sustainable ways. And we do this by meeting our needs for real meaning, purpose, and genuine connection to other people. So I worked long and hard with Tammy to help her overcome past emotional conditioning and start uh, helping her to start meet her primal emotional needs in a balanced way. In hypnosis, we rehearsed her caring less about what others might or might not think of her and challenged the learned thinking that had been causing her so many problems for so long. I also encouraged and helped prepare Tammy for uh, downtime from social media. She cut it down to no more than 90 minutes a day and sometimes much less. We mentally rehearsed her being much less bothered by what she read and saw when it seemed to reflect badly on her by comparison. And feeling and being much more socially spontaneous was something that we also started to focus on. Tammy has become happier and less anxious and she says she feels freer. She started to see differences between herself and others, not in terms of better or worse, but just as differences. After my last session with Tammy, she sent me a clip from YouTube and it was a song by the Kinks called Plastic Man. And she says she'll live her life as a flesh and blood, unique, perfectly imperfect person. She is the only Tammy there is, ever was or ever will be. She will never be a plastic copy of what other people expect. Okay, so I hope you found that useful. And if you did, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to hear where my next video is published, hit the notification bell below. I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge, and I hope I'll see you soon over at unk.com slash blog. That's unk.com slash blog. Thanks for watching.